Okay, um, I wanna thank both of the candidates and everyone who's come to this uh, forum on hunger, housing, and homelessness. I, uh, we're broadcasting this on Facebook Live. My name is Bill Tibbetts. I'm the Deputy Executive Director here at Crossroads Urban Center. Crossroads Urban Center uh, has been running uh, a food pantry and a thrift store. We now have two food pantries um, in the Salt Lake City area. We've been doing that since 1966. Um, and this meeting is being hosted by the Coalition of Religious Communities, which is a project we came up with back in the 1990s to give faith communities that donated food and clothing to our thrift store and, and our food pantry a way to get involved in policy discussions around the people who needed help with those things so that hopefully less people would need help uh, in the future. And so um, I am really grateful that this year we have several primary contests. I, I will tell you one thing people always tell me is a, as, as somebody who brings groups of people up to the state capitol is people who are from the, the you know the the northern part of Salt Lake County will always say oh well my my rep my senator my representative they're a Democrat they always do the right thing and I say well that's probably true um, but there are people who are enthusiastic supporters and there are people who are passive supporters and it's it's good to and so it's really great to have these primary elections where people can talk about these kinds of issues and uh, hopefully, you know, people who live in the district can see if there are differences, people can see them. So thank you both for participating. We sent you both questions beforehand. So hopefully, uh, you know, you, you had a chance, to, well, we, we gave you some time. So uh, let's start off with allowing each of the candidates to introduce themselves. We're gonna start with, uh, Deandra Brown, uh, and I will let her um, introduce herself. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I appreciate you having me this evening. And first, I want to thank Crossroad Urban Center and Bill Tibbetts and Coalition of Religious Communities for the incredible work that you all do on a daily basis and also for the added service that you all provide the community with these candidate forums that you host. An important part of my life the last eight years has been advocating at the Capitol for victims of child abuse and sexual violence. Victims of crime have lived through unspeakable pains and injustices. They are so often overlooked and underrepresented. A main reason I'm here running for Senate District 14 is because vulnerable populations are a priority for me and I will continue to work tirelessly for those who don't have a voice on the Hill. We know that many of our unsheltered brothers and sisters come from traumatic situations. Many courageously escaped domestic violence with their children in tow. Others are sexual abuse and assault victims. And many have lingering mental health barriers that have taken control of their lives. In short, their families and communities have failed them. I'm here today because I not only care about families experiencing homelessness, but I want to do what I can to help move the, the needle forward. I have pushed for funding for mental health services across the state as a member of the Behavioral Health Crisis Response Commission. This legislative commission that it provides insight about statewide suicide prevention efforts as Utah moves towards the national suicide number of 988. Issues pertaining to mental health and access to services will continue to be important to me. I support Salt Lake County's version of the Housing First model as it is imperative that permanent housing is a top priority, especially when paired with critical support services, including mental health care. We need more low income and affordable housing units and must continue looking at ways we can collaborate with and engage developers to also do their part. Low income and affordable housing are each so important to breaking the cycle of intergenerational poverty. 
I co-chair the Utah Coalition for Protecting Childhood, which is a collaborative group of state agencies, private organizations, experts on child abuse and neglect prevention, and community members with the united goal of working together to better protect and support Utah's families. Through my efforts with this coalition, I have worked with the Utah Department of Health's Violence and Injury Prevention Program. We have spoken in depth about evidence-supported strategies to improve the economic and social conditions that play a significant role in our health and safety. These conditions are key to determining how to address community health and safety issues. We continue to discuss the power imbalances that affect the degree to which some communities have access to economic opportunities, affordable housing and quality schools, and others do not. The stigma associated with the unsheltered is also a great concern. They are so marginalized on occasion and discriminated against and are quite vulnerable to violence and victimization. And it's important that we understand that direct pipeline between trauma and homelessness and the impact they can play on quality care. I look forward to tonight's uh, discussion about such important topics and I'm open to learning and rely on the experts as we uh, work towards upstream approaches. Thank you. Okay, um, I am trying to also do uh, timekeeping and I, I forgot to say before we started that uh, when there's when each candidate has, will have three minutes to introduce themselves. When they have 30 seconds left, I'll, I will raise my digital hand. Uh, our, our, the other candidate who's graciously shown up to, to share uh, her, what she, how she, her perspective on, on these important topics is uh, Representative Stephanie Pitcher. So uh, thank you. I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself now. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for hosting this. Um, I, these types of events are some of my favorite things to do on the campaign is engaging on, on issues, issues and policies that we see up at the legislature. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, my name is Representative Stephanie Pitcher. I am uh, currently the representative for House District 40, which is now after redistricting will be House District 32. Uh, my district covers parts of Salt Lake City, Mill Creek and Holiday. Um, I've been in the House of Representatives for four years. I'm the mom to three uh, daughters who go to school in the Granite School District. Um, I work as an attorney. I'm a, a reform-minded prosecutor. Um, but, you know, relevant to this group, I also have uh, done some work. I was working as the legal director for the Homeless Youth, Re or for the homeless youth Legal Clinic for the past year and a half um, and, and just stepped down, actually, as I uh, stepped up to run for the Senate, but did that for about a year. And in my time as a, as a prosecutor, I spent time prosecuting in homeless court, which is, I think, one of the most fantastic resources that we have in our legal system. Um, I love hiking. I love the outdoors. It's one of the things I think makes Utah really great. Um, and, you know, my approach to public policy, what, what really got me involved in the legislature was I've always approached public policy from the standpoint that if we each do what we see in our own lens or in our own um, sort of world of influence, and we try to make a difference within that sphere. Collectively, we can do something really good. And so for me, that started with, I was in law school, I was breastfeeding, um, and I saw an issue in terms of uh, not finding accommodations or not having, uh, not having an avenue to comfortably nurse my child and work. And that led me down sort of a rabbit hole of looking into different legal issues and finding out that Utah was one of Oh, about a half, I think, of the states that didn't provide any legal accommodations for breastfeeding women. So as I looked into that and did my research, I introduced a bill in law school uh, that we ended up passing through Senator Weiler, which provided accommodations for pregnancy and breastfeeding in the workplace. And so it started there within my sort of just what I saw. Um, after being elected to the House of Representatives, I have focused a lot of my work on criminal justice reform. I passed a uh, massive bail reform bill, brought bail reform to Utah. Um, expanded that out, have done some good work um, in innovative childcare solutions for state employees, passed a good bill last session on uh, air quality and cracking down on individuals who circumvent the vehicle emissions testing process, um, passed a bill prohibiting the shackling of uh, pregnant inmates during labor and delivery, and passed also a bill creating a victim address confidentiality program. 
So with that, um, I am hopeful to bring my experience and uh, my time uh, passing these types of reforms into the Senate and, and delivering results for our community. Thanks for having me. Okay, um, th thank you both so for, for, again, for showing up and for introducing yourselves. Um, I, uh, we sent each of the candidates uh, three, three questions um, in anticipation. We'll, I'll, uh, you'll each, we'll give each of you two minutes to, to, to respond to the question. I, um, sent, we, uh, the, the first um, question is, is about sales tax on food, which is um, last year, bills to eliminate the sales tax on food were proposed in the House, but were never, but never got out of the House Rules Committee. Would you be willing to co-sponsor legislation in the Senate, in the Senate to eliminate the sales tax on food? Um, I, will, I think this time we'll start with, with Representative Pitcher. Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so let me just note, co-sponsoring a bill is a little different than sponsoring a bill. Um, co-sponsoring a bill is um, putting your name down in support early on when an individual carries a bill. Um, sponsoring a bill is, is carrying it yourself. I'm willing, of course, to do both. I think it's an important distinction, though. And one thing I'll note about any type of big legislation is that it's important to be uh, strategic and understand sort of the, uh, the, the landscape with which legislation is introduced. But I'm incredibly supportive of eliminating the sales tax on food. Um, we actually had a bill that was introduced this past session. It was SB 59. And uh, that bill introduced a number of different tax related provisions. One thing that it did is it cut the, the tax rate, the income rate from 4.95 to 4.85. Um, also made some changes to social security benefits and in, implemented an earned income tax credit. Throughout the process of that bill, one of my colleagues introduced a substitute that would have done exactly what, what you suggested Bill would. It would have removed, uh, would have removed the sales tax on food. I voted in support of that amendment or that substitute. And when that failed, I voted against SB 59 because I felt like ultimately any comprehensive changes that we make to the tax scheme have to include this. Uh, sales tax is a regressive tax. Um, I don't think we should be putting this type of a burden on individuals in poverty when the biggest portion of their income is already going towards their basic needs, foods, diapers, things like that. Um, again, I don't support aggressive policies, so I, I would be supportive of that. Okay, um, thank you. I, uh, Deandra Brown. Thank you. Uh, yes, Utah is one of just 13 states that still includes groceries in our sales tax base. This places a heavy tax burden on low income families and makes it more difficult for them to feed their families and in a healthy way. Um, we know from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities that a food tax also worsens income and racial inequalities as well. The lowest income fifth of families are disproportionately families of color. They pay almost eight times more as a share of their incomes in sales tax than the top 1% of families. So taxing groceries and then offering a tax credit back to low income families also adds complications because it doesn't typically offset grocery taxes for those below the poverty level. And, and to receive it, they'd also have to know to apply for it and how to fill out the required paperwork. And these can be uh, significant barriers and are not conducive to helping those within the lower income level. So I believe the best plan for low income families is to remove the tax on food and I plan to support this effort. But if the governor and legislature as a whole are determined not to eliminate it and to go the direction of a tax credit, they really need to amend the newly established state earned income tax to be a refundable tax credit that provides needed assistance to strengthen economic supports for vulnerable populations. So regardless, the elimination of food tax needs to be revisited so families can directly see the benefits to their limited income. Great, that was, thank you. Um, okay, I think for the next question, question we'll, we'll start with, with, um, with Ms. Ms. Brown. Um, this year, the state of Washington passed a bill declaring that chronic homelessness is a medical condition and the permanent supportive housing is a form of healthcare. Uh, would you support similar legislation in Utah and or funding for building and operating permanent supportive housing? 
So thank you for this question. Um, Washington State took a very interesting approach. The state authorized, as you mentioned, Medicaid to provide support services when paired with housing for those experiencing long-term homelessness. So they base their arguments on research that demonstrates that supportive housing is the most cost-effective and humane way to approach chronic homelessness. There are several interesting components of the Washington Bill, such as investing in prevention services and creating a more supportive housing network statewide, all important strategies that will hopefully move them in the right direction. Although I greatly admire Washington State's le legislators for being forward thinking and exploring outside the box, I do have some concerns that legislation of this sort in Utah would not even get out of committee, unfortunately. As the super minority, I think it is important that we have these discussions of this type. And that's how I believe legislators' appetites and public opinion begins to shift over time. But I also value collaboration across the aisle as it's imperative to getting legislation passed here in Utah. And I truly believe legislators on both sides of the aisle want to find solutions for the housing insecure in our communities. So while I don't feel Utah would see successful implementation of sweeping housing legislation like Washington has passed, I do think there is much we can do to address the systemic barriers that make accessing services such as affordable housing, SNAP, WIC and Medicaid so difficult. Utah needs to remove requirements that stigmatize, dehumanize, and discourage individuals and families from seeking these services. So practices such as requiring drug testing and work requirements communicate that if you struggle with substance use disorder or have barriers to employment, you don't deserve access to safe housing, medical, medical care, or food. So the community members who suffer the most to these policies, unfortunately, are the children, and we need to have this change. Thank you. Um, Representative Pitcher, do you need to read the question again, or is it? Um... Yeah, I got it. I think I've got it. OK. Okay. So yeah, uh, to answer the question simply, yes, I would be supportive of increased funding um, for that purpose. Um, you know, one thing I think is interesting about Utah is we have led the way in terms of creating innovative supportive housing models. Um, we were one of the first states to model permanent support, supportive housing. Um, and this idea of permanent supportive housing, essentially, you know, we're servicing individuals who are in shelters because they can't, they struggle to function on their own. Usually they're struggling with super mental health issues, um, health issues, substance uh, addiction. They cycle in and out of the shelter. Um, you know, individuals will get picked up by police, get tried for small petty drug offenses, and all of this costs the system more money. And so the idea behind it is that it's, it's a cheaper solution in the sense that if you can give an individual permanent supportive housing, um, you're ultimately going to set them up for success in the longer run and also cost the state less money in terms of the services that we provide to these individuals. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think this is a great way for the state to really get at the root of the issue and invest significant uh, funding in a way that actually makes a difference for these individuals. I also think uh, it's important to note, and we'll probably get into this in the next question, but we are in a significant housing crisis right now. And our state, the cost of living in the state of Utah is about 12%, which is higher than what we're seeing in around the country. The country is about 8%. Um, so we have a real issue in, in the state of Utah in terms of people just can't afford their homes. And one way that we can really address, one way can we, we can really address this um, is to uh, help individuals who, again, instead of cycling them in and out of the shelter, uh, through different state services, we can actually give them supportive housing as a baseline to set them up for success later on. Thank you so much. I, I, um, I am kind of a, a policy person, and so I am going to have to say a couple words about because I think actually, I, I think what's important is to realize is that actually Utah just got a waiver approved to integrate housing retention related services into our state Medicaid program. Um, I, I'm a little bit disappointed that the, that, that, um, that the, 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 the population that's eligible for these services is more narrow than I would have it be. And so, I mean, there's reasons to expand that, but I think we really are as a state are right at a point where we're, we are beginning to integrate 
healthcare services, behavioral health services, and, and homeless services, so that um, people who really should never have been in a shelter because, you know, a shelter isn't a mental health care facility, um, like go as quickly as possible to somewhere that is appropriate for, for somebody with serious mental illness and, uh, you know, no in, and no income. I mean, I, I think uh, we, it's, uh, and I, I would also say, I mean, we have a governor who proposed putting $127 million in, into this kind of really targeted housing and uh, this, this past session. And so there is support on both sides of the aisle that, that's deeper than, uh, than I would have anticipated. And it's part of it, it's because it works, right? I mean, for people who are acting out serious mental illness on the street, there really isn't, they're not going to suddenly self-actualize when everything about their life is triggering their mental illness. I mean, and uh, when their service, when the people who would love to help them, you know, can't find them half the time. So um, that's, uh, I, I um, okay, so I, I'm not trying, I'm not supposed to get on my soapbox when I'm moderating these, but I, I can't help myself, sorry. Um, the last question we sent to both candidates is um, the, the time of life when a, a person in this country is most likely to become homeless is infancy. Um, would you support funding and or legislation to spur the production of more low income housing that meets the needs of families with children? I, I think this question is particularly timely because this morning, there's an article in the newspaper talking about that uh, the number of children, the number of families with children that can afford to live in uh, the new, in, in, our, in our, the district where all three of us live, um, is declining. So the, the number of students in, our, in school districts, in, in Granite School District, is, is declining, particularly in, in the part of the district that we live in. And so I... I um, <sighs> So I, again, I got to jump back on my soapbox, but uh, would you support uh, funding and or legislation to spur the production of more low-income housing that meets the needs of families with children? Uh, Representative Pitcher, we'll start with you this time. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yes, yes, I would. Um, I think, you know, as you stated, Bill, it's a critical issue and you make an important point that uh, children are the most common def demographic to become homeless. Um, often people have, I think, this negative perception or stereotype of what it means to be homeless. I think a lot of people um, don't think of it in terms of the duration of one's life. They have this image in mind, but children are the most likely to become homeless. Um, and they're, st they're st statistically more likely to cycle through the system their whole lives, if, if, that's, if that's the case. Chances are uh, the chances that they're likely to graduate from uh, high school, lower, enter into the foster care system, chances are higher, enter or experience some type of substance abuse addiction higher. Um, and so if you can't give kids some stability, you're just going to see them through cycling through the system over and over again. And I think right now, I, I mentioned this previously, but the problem is that the housing issue, it, it's always been an issue for those in poverty, but it's, that's, it's no longer limited to that demographic. We are in a housing crisis right now. And the, the problem is simply that the housing stock is just not meeting the needs of our families. And it's impacting individuals up to a moderate income level. And so something absolutely needs to be done. I am very supportive of increased funding for lower income housing options. Um, I think there's a lot that we can do as a state to invest in this area. And I think it's one of the most important and critical things that we could do right now. And you know, one other thing that I've been thinking about recently is uh, apart from the funding issue, which I think is a really important component, I think the state ought to also consider working with the League of Cities and Towns to figure out what we can do to incentivize uh, cities to loosen up some of their zoning requirements and allowing for greater density housing. I, I see that also as a big problem as Utah experiences growth and we don't have enough housing stock. Um, so to, to answer your question, I am supportive. And I think beyond the funding, there are other things we can do as well. Yeah, no, I, that, that, I'll, I'm not supposed to say yeah either. I'm, uh being a bad moderator, I, I, uh, I'm used to being in conversations, not, um, but okay, uh, Ms. Brown, uh, are you, do you want me to repeat the question or? No, I'm good, thanks, Bill. Yeah. 
So when we think that 35% of those experiencing homelessness are families with children, I mean, it's, it's simply unacceptable that we not do much more than we are already to help them. Um, there's thousands of homeless families with children under the age of six years old. And we know that this particular age group, like th th these, they're, the effects of this trauma can be lifelong and profound. So shelter is a fundamental necessity. And if a child is without it, many other lifelong challenges could occur to shape their life in a different way. Their development can be directly affected and it's difficult, if not impossible, for them to succeed in school when you're not sure where you're gonna sleep that night. So not only are these children faced with insurmountable challenges, they're undoubtedly dealing with a ton of trauma from these experiences. I mean, many of them have escaped domestic violence situations or child abuse with their mothers and are, you know, quite honestly starting over. And we need to do much better to serve them, to build stronger community safety nets that minimize the lifelong impacts we need to shorten the length that families stay in the shelters and do much more so that they don't end up right back in the system again. We need to invest much more in low income housing in collaboration, as was mentioned with cities and counties and to specifically address the unique needs of families. They need a stable place to recover from trauma and the opportunity to start over with important services at their disposal, social workers, medical and mental health services, food, hygiene, education for their children and childcare so that the mothers can safely search for employment again. So we need to do better at funding also and supporting our local nonprofits like the Crossroads Urban Center who work in this space so they can better serve their clients as well and more quickly find secure housing for our families. I would like to unmute myself first off and, and say that this has been a great exchange and as somebody who lives in the district, I am thrilled that these are these these are the are the choices in, the, in this race. Um, I uh, the uh, we're going to uh, end with giving each candidate a chance to uh, say whatever they want to say as is, 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 is a closing statement. You um, you'll give each of you three minutes. At this time, we'll, we'll start with Representative Pitcher. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you again for having me. I've really enjoyed the conversation. These are critical issues. Again, I think these are probably the biggest issues our state is facing right now, one of the biggest issues being housing. Um, but I think to summarize from the conversation today and some of the issues that we've addressed is, I think that, you know, as we, as we think about these issues, the most, most important thing we can recognize is that um, it takes a very um, collaborative sort of integrated approach to addressing issues such as homelessness and housing. Um, none of these things can be addressed or, or solved in a silo. And I think I've seen this um, really play out in my work with at the VOA and with the homeless youth at the Homeless Youth Resource Center. So as I mentioned briefly, I work as or worked as the legal director and essentially what we did is we would help youth with their with their um, legal issues. But in doing that, I really respected the model that the VOA developed. And, and what they do there is they provide shelter, of course, for, for um, unsheltered youth. Um, but they also create a mechanism to address legal issues. That's where I came in. They, came, they addressed a mechanism to ex address uh, expungement. They helped them get set up with healthcare. They provided job training, financial literacy classes. Um, there's a mental health component and all of this is built into the VOA shelter. Um, and the way that that model has been developed um, here in Salt Lake City, I think is a really good example for the state in terms of the way that we tackle these broader issues. You cannot solve one without solving the others. And if you give individuals the tools that they need to be successful with their basic needs, you're going to set them up for success with their secondary needs. And so what I mean by that is if we invest in um, the right ways to get individuals housing uh, to make sure that their basic needs are met in terms of food, um, their studies show that they are much more likely to get their secondary needs met. I, by that, I mean uh, a job, being productive, uh, living a healthy lifestyle. Um, and this is the right approach. As a state, this is the right way to invest. Um, and that's the, the, the uh, perspective that I would bring to the Senate if I were elected. Thank you again so much for having me. 
And you can learn more about me and the work that I've done on my website, or I'm happy to take any questions over Facebook or my cell phone. You can find all of that online. Thank you. Um, what, Ms. Brown, I, I, we will let you have the, well, the second to last word, because I'll say some other things when you're done, but uh, thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. And uh, I have been privileged enough over the years to, to be an advocate for underrepresented voices and in particular children. And I believe we have so much uh, work ahead of us to make sure that we prioritize solutions for homeless families and especially those with children. Um, I, I do fully believe in the fact that there's a direct link between um, trauma and those who have experienced trauma and, and uh, those who become part of this homeless population. And so I feel like the sooner we can continue to dive into how we can, uh, how we can help those who have lived through such uh, traumatic events to get on their feet, the more we'll, we'll be able to understand uh, the many vast services that they need to be able to uh, go throughout their lives and do the things that they would hope to do. So I appreciate the collaborative nature that is already um, been occurring with the legislature in the cities and counties and those um, who all the many parties that are involved and I feel like the more we work together, the more we can come up with creative and uh, important uh, solutions that I think will really make a difference in the lives of so many families. So I appreciate Bill the fact that many of your questions uh, tonight had a spin specifically targeted towards children and families and um, as as someone who uh, has a special place in my heart for these types of issues. Um, I have appreciated being able to uh, connect the dots in a lot of ways in terms of how whenever you want to talk about protecting children from abuse and from neg neglect, you really need to make sure that you also have a fuller picture of where that these trauma and these experiences could be coming from. So, so we need to take a bigger look at how these issues connect and do much better by the families that we serve. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I just, I wanted to end by, by first off, thanking both of you for participating, thanking the people who've watched. This video will be posted both on, on the Crossroads Urban Center website and on uh, our Facebook page. Um, and so uh, you, if, you know, we, and we'll be sharing it with people. So thank you for that. We, tomorrow are having a form asking the exact same questions with uh, the two candidates in, in Senate District 9, which used to be District 2 represented. Uh, so both Senator Derek Kitchen and his challenger, uh, Dr. Jen Pond. So that should be an also really interesting discussion. It is um, nice to have races where people have such informed opinions. I, I, um, I think that they're often times when their Canada forms and issues of homelessness come up, you just get NIMBY reactions or you just get, and, and we haven't heard any of that. So thank you both for running. Thank you both for having, being people who have informed opinions about these issues. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Okay, good, uh, thanks. <laughs>